Welcome back to Drone Safe Dialogues. This one's going to be fun. Today, we'll hear about the history and evolution of stand up comedy and how especially challenging it is these days to be in the business of being funny. When I first heard that stand up comedy would be our topic, I immediately thought back to when I was first young and single living in New York City. My wing woman was a stand up comedian. She made going to bad events not just cringeworthy, but also hilarious because seeing awkward interactions through her eyes showed me the humor and absurdity in pretty much any situation. What she was so good at, and what all the best stand-up comedians have mastered, is revealing and examining vulnerable moments in our life and poking fun at absurdity in ways that everyone can relate to. In this way, stand-up comedy actually has a lot in common with the liberal arts. Pushing boundaries, critiquing and analyzing, finding the universal aspects in our unique stories, and in the process, revealing and celebrating our shared humanity. So I can't wait to hear what our speakers have to say about all of this. Our panel today will be moderated by Kirsten Eggers. Kirsten is an assistant professor of theater practice in comedy performance at the USC School of Dramatic Arts. She is an actor, writer, and comedic performer with extensive television and improv comedy experience. She's also a Trojan alum, holding a BFA in acting from the School of Dramatic Arts, where she won both the Jack Nicholson Award and the Ava Greenwald Award for Outstanding Actor. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Kirsten's capable hands to introduce our panel. Thank you, as always, for tuning in and enjoy the program. Thank you, Dean Miller. I'm so excited to be here. And I have to say, I remember being young and single also, and how comedy was a really big part of that for me as well. Um, I'm so excited to be here with our panel today of expert scholars and working stand-up comedians. Um, let me introduce them to you. We have here with us, Professor Lenita Jacobs, Associate Professor in the Departments of American Studies and Ethnicity and Anthropology at USC. Among other topics, she studies African-American stand-up comedy, and last year she published her second book, To Be Real, Truth and Racial Authenticity in African-American Stand-Up Comedy, which is based on long-term observations and interviews with Black comics from 2001 to 2008. Hi, Lenita. Thanks for being here. Hi. Good to be here. Oh, hi. Next, we have Wayne Fetterman. Uh, Wayne is an adjunct lecturer at the USC School of Dramatic Arts and a working, currently working, stand-up comedian and actor. He is the author of The History of Stand-Up, From Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle, and last year won a Primetime Emmy Award for producing HBO's George Carlin's American Dream. Hi, Wayne. Hello. It's nice to be here. And... Uh... By the way, I'm still single. Let's go. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Let's keep it going. All right. Um, and lastly, we have Cruz Arroyo is a PhD candidate in English at USC Dornsife, currently working on his dissertation titled, I Can't Make This Stuff Up, Fictionality, Autobiography, and Deviance in American Stand-Up Comedy. Hi, Cruz. Hey, how you doing? Happy to be here. So um, the, you know, the title of our hour here today is Stand-Up Comedy, Its Historic Influence on Society, but I thought we should um, keep it a little personal just to kick us off here, because um, stand-up can be very personal, we'll get into that, but I was reflecting on my own comedy experience, this is the last time I'll talk about myself, but um, I would say as a comic performer, my kind of first big influence was, it was a, um, it was a special, I don't know a channel, maybe ABC, and I think it was a Kennedy Center thing, <laughs> and it was Carol <laughs> Burnett and Julie Andrews doing a two-woman comedy show together, and I had a VHS tape of it, and I watched it every day after school. It does not hold up. Please, nobody look it up, um, <laughs> as, as comedy often does not, but um, it was really important to me as a female comedian, seeing these women really take over the stage, be goofy, and still be quite feminine, um, and really, really own their comedic senses and really own the stage like that. So that's my share about what kicked me off into this comedy career and this comedy interest. Um, so I would just love to hear just briefly from each of you, maybe something that you can identify as your 
first or an early influence of mm-hmm. seeing some stand up that maybe set you up for later in your life and your studies and your work now. Um, mm-hmm. Lenita, do you want to start us off? Sure, I will. Um, two memories come to mind. They're connected. One is one that we all might be familiar with. Growing up in a household, there'd be Thanksgiving, we go to my uncle's house. And um, every now and then towards the evening, the adults would descend into the basement. And all of a sudden you just hear laughter, 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 because they were listening to records by people like uh, Nipsey Russell Mm -hmm. and others. And Mm -hmm. so that was just glorious to hear your parents and your older relatives laughing in a whole new way. And then my mother must have known something that I didn't know. She's um, funny and she appreciates funny. And my dad is a, a, a beautiful clown. Mm-hmm. Anyway, she used to make us play, make me laugh. And uh, so you had to get up there and you had to make your family members laugh. You could not work. You could not. You had to stop and do it. And um, I used to didn't always want to play because I have some really funny siblings. But um <laughs> There was something she was doing in that moment. I, I better understand it now, but she was just trying to prepare us for this world. Sometimes laughter can can set you free. Yes, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Cruz, how about you? An early influence for you? Yeah, when I think back, I'm, I tr- I'm transported to high school and I'm at home and Paul Mooney is on YouTube <laughs> and I'm laughing so hard that I like can't breathe. And it was like the first time that I ever had watched a stand-up set where it had affected me that much, where I was like really gasping for air, I had to pause it. And I just remember being so taken by like, you know, the power that he had on stage, really like how unmovable he was and how he was able to affect everybody. And also the the content of what he was talking about, how he was able to bring such really hot button issues and yet uh, bring so much grace and power and passion to them. Uh, so that that had me hooked right then. Great. Thank you. Wayne, how about you? Well, my experience is pretty similar to Lanita's in that it was an audio version first, and it was, excuse the expression, Bill Cosby's first album mm-hmm. called uh, Why Is mm-hmm. There Air? Uh, excuse me, not Why Is There Bill Cosby is a very funny fellow, right? Yeah, yeah. And then every year we got a new album of his. Like, again, Why Is There Air? Wonderfulness. Uh, and so... He, so that was my first even hearing, like, what is, what's going on? Who are these people laughing? What is this club he's at? So that intrigued me very early on. And then later I saw on something called the Jerry Lewis Telethon, which was a Labor Day event, a 24-hour telethon. I saw Milton Berle do a stand-up <laughs> routine for six minutes. I was like, oh, is that what caused me? Okay. And then I put the two together and then I was, I was off from there, but there's, those are the two earliest. Mm-hmm. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for sharing that, sharing that little personal story, um, your personal influence. All right, so let's blow it up here. So we're talking about the influence on society, a huge topic, of course. But um, it would be lovely to us to kind of, and this is a huge topic, and Wayne, you, um, you teach a semester-long class on the history of stand-up. So Correct. You- could cover this for hours and hours and hours, but, um, and you have a book also, which I already mentioned about this, but um, do you think, Wayne, you could maybe, you know, highlight some of the um, comedians that stand out to you as being, you know, you know, since the beginning of what we consider modern stand-up comedy, what you consider to be the most influential? Are there some goalposts that we could highlight that stand out to you? Well, I mean, obviously, I, I'm going to start early on in the 1800s mm-hmm. with uh, four gentlemen, which I refer to as the four forefathers of stand-up, which are in birth order, um, Artemis Ward, Mark Twain, Burt Williams, and Will Rogers. Those four, almost all stand-up comedy can be traced directly back to those four gentlemen. And then after that, I mean, it's just a slew. There was this incredible woman named Moms Mabley who was, she was forced to perform on the, what was called the Chitlin Circuit, which was show business was very much uh, segregated in, even in the North, it wasn't just a Southern thing. And so she was a, an early standup that I think is very important. Obviously Lenny Bruce because of the multiple arrests and then Mort Saul, Cruz knows all about that guy. And then you know, and then everything kind of broke open in the 70s when uh, Richard Pryor and George Carlin started doing unedited 
completely free speech specials and movies of their stand up. And then from there, we're, you know, we're, you know, Seinfeld right up to, you know, John Mulaney and, and Dave Chappelle, who is who I like to talk about quite a bit because he's a very interesting guy and uh, in the history of it all. But those are just a few. I could name another 40, but I don't know if that's close. Lenita, am I close? I mean, in the ballpark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Lenita, do you want to respond to some of those Wayne mentioned in terms of, um, you know, briefly how they affected society rather than rather than just even just affecting the field of comedy and how comedy was done or performed? How was it changing people? How was it changing people's minds? Any of those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wayne mentioned um, Burt Williams and Moms Mabley. And I talk about them in my book. There's no way to talk about Black stand-up comedy without it. Um, for those who may not know, I was in the clubs from 2001 to 2008, trying to figure out first what Black comics um, had to say about 9-11, it's the September 11th terrorist attacks, if at all. Um, but I was after something a little bit more. I was chasing that laughter that I would hear um, my relatives in that basement. I was chasing that laughter because they were laughing at something that was shared and communal. And Bert, and um, that after 2001. Oh gosh, we, we, we needed it. And although it took a while for folks to start making jokes about it. But um, when I think about Bert Williams, when I think about Moms Maidley, one, I think about something that Wayne probably knows very well, Cruz too, is that um, comics um, bless us with laughter, but on the flip side, there can be tremendous sadness. So Bert Williams, um, there was another comic who described him as one of the saddest comedians he knew. Um, but if you saw Burt Williams on stage, even if you see him now, tell me if I'm lying, Wayne, he will just make you laugh with his nonverbal, like just the nuance of, of what he does, um, in blackface, in blackface. Yeah. So, um, in mom's baby, she didn't have to wear blackface in part because Burt Williams pushed, helped to push the, the field so far for black stand-up comedians, but she did wear this kind of hat and this granny dress. Uh, but she would tell people, um, when she was interviewed, um, ain't no granny baby this is a i'm mobs mabley i got a split level in the suburbs baby you know mm. both of them were doing a tremendous work in their day to tell jokes about the racial condition um also aspects of the universal condition and make black people laugh from a deep hearted place like that gasping that cruz was talking mm. about and uh that's frankly why i was in the clubs all the time trying to chase the legacy of people like bird williams and mobs mabley who were able to tap into uh, despair, sadness, hunger, scarcity, but also joy and love and celebration and um, love. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Cruz, you see, I feel like you wanna say something. Do you oh yeah, I have a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I think picking up on what Lenita said, you know, part of where I start my work is when did comedians start bringing themselves to the stage? When did they start talking about their autobiographical details in themselves? And I start at the, in the 50s, around the 50s and 60s with the, what they called the new wave comedians. So Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, Dick Gregory, I would even add Joan Rivers in there, where they were trying to negotiate how to talk about things on stage that matter to them, but really break away from the kind of uniformity that comedy sometimes finds itself in, you know, in the vaudeville eras, it was, there was a lot of plagiarism because you can build your act off of joke books and skit, sketches and skits, yeah. right? And then uh, like kind of in the 50s and 60s, there were the, the tuxedo comedians that were kind of also giving canned jokes. So when it came to the, the new wave comics, it was how do I bring a level of uh, autobiography, a level of political insight, a level of the things that, uh, insights into things that actually matter to me, but how do I merge that into character? So there was a lot of strategy in the 50s thinking about how do I bring this kind of new style of comedy to audiences? And Mort Saul kind of, uh, his trademark was that kind of stream of consciousness, kind of really long-winded style that audiences needed to get used to. It wasn't an automatic, okay, we're on board. There was a big, a little bit of a learning process and trial and error on stage. Uh, yeah. Um, I want to, yeah, I want to talk about the, um, 
the, I mean, you, you already mentioned, um, Lenita, how powerful and important, um, people being together in a, in, in these rooms together or, uh, you know, lip laughing together, building community, building joy, um, and listening to questions that maybe we're not ready or, you know, the, the society doesn't feel like they're ready to hear, but, you know, comedy is the an important part of comedy is pushing boundaries, right? Um, it creates a little shock in people's systems to wake them up a little bit sometimes on a physiological level almost. I mean, it does. Um, sound comes out of your mouth in the form of laughter. Um, so, so I mean, let's talk about why stand-up is so powerful um, and we can link it to the, you know, the many examples of censorship. Wayne brought up um, Lenny Bruce, maybe the most famous uh, example of censorship. Um, I would love to talk about that and, and relate it to, you know, again, a huge topic, but what is happening now with uh, people mentioning cancel culture? What are we allowed to do in comedy? Mm -hmm. sure. Wayne, do you want to kick us off or Lenita? Yeah. No, Wayne, go first. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I just to give a little context to the whole thing. Why I think stand up is powerful is I was just thinking about this the other day going through Netflix when you see like a multi million dollar movie or that's an option or a television show that cost $15 million an episode. And then right next to it is one person standing on stage with <laughs> a microphone and you can click on that. Like, and it's right next to it. So again, stand up falls under the umbrella of entertainment. These are professionals who are trying to get laughs. That's the that's sort of the mission statement of it. But it also intersects with so many other things that we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, briefly, Lenny Bruce is very important in my mind because he, and there was other comedians and comedic actors. I mean, Mae West in 1927, went to jail for 10 days for speech crimes, for something she said on stage. So it, this is, again, we're supposedly have the First Amendment, and it wasn't really until the 70s that that all, all was allowed. Uh, but Lenny Bruce really was arrested in four cities, all liberal cities. This was San Francisco, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York City for speech crimes. This was in a nightclub. I know this sounds crazy. And for those people who don't know this story, in a nightclub, these are adults who paid money to go in to watch a show on their own volition. And sure enough, because of something he said, and Cruz speaks about it in his paper that he's still writing, that it was mainly because he was attacking the Catholic Church. That was the main, I think, as we look back at it. So there were forces that wanted to basically shut him up. You know, he's a Jewish kid from, I think he's from Freeport, Long Island, and now he's uh, attacking people's belief systems. So that was, so he was arrested, not, oh, protested, not, oh, I got a bad comment or a letter to the editor. He was literally arrested and had to fight these charges. There were local laws that, they, that a lot didn't allow obscenity, and he used he used the language of America. He used street language in his act. So um, anyway, I could go on and on, but that didn't really end comedians getting arrested by the government mm -hmm. until really the 70s when HBO started doing their, their um, HBO on location, which were their one hour stand-up specials. So um, the first one was in 75. And then what's happened, these sort of local obscenity laws sort of melted away. But uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to someone else. But that's the basic story of why we still talk about Lenny Bruce. And also his subject matter was not exactly, as Cruz said, was not generic jokes at all. He was talking about dark stuff. He was talking about racism. He was talking about uh, police brutality. He was talking about... Uh, Inter, interracial relationships. He was like really looking at the entire, the entire complex fabric of 1950s America. Yeah. That's it. That's all I have to say about him. Yeah. I can build <laughs> off of that. Um, what's really cool about 
the Lenny Bruce trials and what I've learned is, you know, it's one of the first times where stand up is brought to trial to really try to figure out, mm -hmm. is this a staged antagonism that's meant to move us in some kind of way? Is it a performance or is this a real offense going on? Is there something actually here that needs to be contained so that it protects people from harm? Right. And uh, part of Bruce's defense was that uh, an actor who was reading a script was not to be held liable for like any obscenity that's in the script. But what the judges found was that since Bruce had written his own material and was performing it as himself, he didn't have those protections, right? So it's the first time where we really are starting to figure out like what's happening here. Is this real? Is it fake? Is it is it staged? Is it authentic? And that's the kind of hybrid form that uh, stand up has grown to be. Yeah. Lenita, could you, um, we talked about this a little bit the other day, but could you maybe link these, I mean, you know, people don't get arrested for their comedy anymore, I don't think, um, but, you know, this has been a huge topic the last few years, maybe even longer, um, about what comedians should be allowed to do, um, and, you know, there's a lot of whatever, online backlash, et cetera, um, about what material comedians are tackling. Lenita, do you, can you talk about some current or, you know, recent examples of um, what censorship is now or the, the equivalent of getting arrested by the government? Is it the same? Mm. Sure, sure, sure. And, and I'll start by just addressing that question that I love so much. What is beautiful about stand-up yes, comedy? Please. Yeah. And part of what's beautiful about stand-up comedy is um, something that uh, Wayne mentions in his book. Uh, he says one of the things that all these comics that have been mentioned before have in common is at the end of the day, they <laughs> all perform as a single person on stage with a mic, you know? And the beauty for me is what happens when a comedian greets their audience, hey, what's up? And that buzz of the microphone before you hear the audience's reply, I, I love that sound because you just never know what's possible. Yeah. And when I was in the clubs, um, a lot of them, you know, I was chasing black stand-up comedy. I was in the black comedy rooms, black comedy clubs, the comedy union, um, uh, effect Tuesdays at the comedy store, um, just, just wherever black comedy was. And what was beautiful about it was that, you know, once again, I'm thinking about my parents and family members in the basement, the adults only, uh, a comedian was saying something and it was tapping into something that made people say oh I know what that feels like <laughs> you know I know what that's that's about and in black comedy it, to some extent they were playing on shared cultural knowledge which to me as an anthropologist is just amazing like that's where I want to be to you know jokes about hair oh that says something about the way that black people deal with the politics and and the beauty of hair and all those kinds of things um but then it also can be universal. So when I'm scrolling Netflix and I have to choose between a movie or I'll say, oh, I wonder what's going on with this person. It doesn't matter necessarily what they look like because all of them are tapping into what is both um, individual and unique about themselves, but also that thread that kind of binds us all. Um, one thing I will say is um, you can't talk about Black stand-up comedy without talking about one of the most globally recognized comics of all time, which is now Kevin Hart, <laughs> you know? Mm. And um, I, one of my chapters mm. in my book is, is about him. And um, as we all know, Kevin Hart got into some issues and was asked to apologize again for some humor that was homophobic that he had apologized for times um, uh, in, in, its, in his past uh, stand-up. And for that, he lost uh, one, of his, one of his number one dreams, mm -hmm. which was to host, host the Oscars because he refused mm -hmm. to, to apologize again. There's another controversy that people may not know as much about, but to me, it speaks to the ways in which Black comics have to wrestle with something that Cruz mentioned, which is questions of authenticity. Um, that is um, not just sincerity, is there a truth between what I am saying and what I'm joking about, but also racial authenticity, real blackness. Now I'm gonna put quotes around that because who is to say what real blackness is, but I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that black audiences are looking at Kevin Hart to say, are you still connected to us? Are you still tethered to us? And this is not new to Kevin Hart. It's also something that Bill Cosby and others had to kind of wrestle with. Uh, Kevin got in trouble because he tweeted some comments that reeked of colorism, the preference for lighter skin over darker skin in the African-American community. That's going to be a problem. That's going to be a problem. And so Black women came for him. Um, and uh, Kevin, so astute, uh, and his crew, um, the Plastic Cup Boys, 
um, staged a, a set uh, in one of his recorded stand-up albums of Black women literally coming for him <laughs> around those kinds of issues. Um, so there are ways where what you tell on a stage with a single microphone coming from you and just jokes, just jokes, can land in a way where you know, people hear it and they feel some kind of way because to some extent, yes, you might be representing yourself, but because if your jokes speak louder, say Chris Rock making jokes about Black folks uh, versus uh, the N-word um, in a predominantly African-American uh, field stadium, um, you can just be brought up to, to, to account for those kinds of jokes and how those jokes can lend themselves to promoting Eurocentrism in the case of Kevin Hart's uh, jokes about colorism or in the case of um, uh, Chris Rock, um, be co-opted by the right to say something about um, so-called N-words as being deserving of their you know, mm. fates. Um, and uh, Wayne can tell it better, maybe Cruz can too, um, but there's just something that has happened to stand-up comedy with the rise of social media and the internet. And uh, there are folks who may not like what you say and they can come for you and they can cancel, cancel you or try to, um, or, and they may or may not be successful. Um, and that intrigues me um, almost as the fact, and this is my final comment, that comics can also participate in the business of canceling other people too. <laughs> and some of the uh, critiques that they made and the momentum that they build around those critiques. So um, one of the reasons why stand-up comedy is so special is because stand-up comics are also quite powerful. Mm -hmm. What what are I mean we can open this up and Lenita or or Wayne or Cruz can answer also but um as always but um what are some examples I mean have we talk so much about cancel culture with comedy um these days but are there examples have people had their their comedy come to a close almost or like very altered what they're doing uh, mm. comedy wise or or is stand up so powerful that. Mm. It's it's not going to happen. Is stand up so powerful that it that it is a, you know a strong enough force against whatever online communities are coming for uh, mm -hmm. a comedian and what they're saying? Yeah. I'll say well, something and then I'll be done on this question. Um, one is um, um, what's his name? Louis. Louis C.K. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Louis C.K. Right, Louis. Uh -huh. Louis. Um, you know, he did some things in, in front of women, and and, and and that came out. Um, but he's still working. He's still yeah. working. I think he had a, a certain kind of penance. But there is also um, uh, the great still with us, um, but late when we think comedically, um, maybe his, his, his son will rise again, but Michael Richards is, right? Mm -hmm. Michael Richards had that moment at the um, Laugh Factory where he felt he was being heckled by a, a, a very diverse group and he used the N-word um, repeatedly and he landed that ER. Uh, Chris Spencer says, avoid the ER in the N-word if you want to stay out of the ER, the emergency room. Well, well Michael landed it um, and has been paying paying for that um, ever since. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking of the of uh, Ralphie May and his mm -hmm. trouble with the indigenous community and thinking about cancel culture and like the literal sense of what, uh, what shows get canceled. He mm -hmm. had done a bit um, kind of uh, really roasting indigenous communities. And uh, I'm not sure where it's from, but where it got picked up from was an indigenous hip hop group, I think called Savage Family, mm -hmm. uh, uh, posted, or not posted, but on their album, one of the tracks is uh, Ralphie Mae's bit, really like just going in on them. And uh, when that was, well, I think that was picked up by another indigenous comedian and reposted to YouTube. And then the the backlash happened, and he actually had a lot of his uh, shows canceled and needed to um, uh, reach out to the indigenous communities to say that, you know, to, to A, give context to the joke, but also explain that even with context, why was he making that joke, et cetera. And even with the Ralphie May example, um, this can tie back to, you know, how social media is affecting things, but it's very rare nowadays that we actually encounter these jokes and these punchlines you know, within the context of a, of, a, of, a, of a live show or in the, the entire specials themselves. A lot of the times they're reposted as snippets to YouTube mm -hmm. or we can mm -hmm. see them as like tweets mm -hmm. or we get these flashes, right? And in those flashes, there's not a lot of uh, opportunity for comedians to build trust and really build, uh, like work the room. We can't work the room if the room is, if people 
that are considered in the room are all over the globe, right? And so that uh, presents a lot of different challenges of like, okay, I heard the punchline, I didn't hear the setup. Yeah. And since I don't know anything about surrounding this, I'm not sure what to make of the comedian's intentions, right? And so there's a lot of rupture of trust there. And I think without that trust, you can't really have comedy bring people together. It actually has the, the opposite effect because like there's a lot of confusion there. Wayne, you want to hop in? Well, I mean, it's this is such a fraught topic that mm -hmm. uh, all I can say is there's now there's been people protesting comedians back to the mm -hmm. early 1900s. There were people that were protesting. There was blackface comedians. There was obviously Frederick Douglass had these incredible things he was saying about that, you know, hundred over 100 years ago. And comedy used to be way more ethnic than it is now. And there were people that were protesting vaudeville comedians. So this has been going on <clears throat> a long time, a long time. Mm -hmm. What's different now is obviously the power of, oh, now instead of 20 people in a Cleveland who are upset with a vaudeville guy, there's thousands of people all over the world that share that same point of view that can attack that comedian. So it feels like, oh, whoa, this is, this is happening. And so... I mean, there's a reason blackface comedy doesn't exist anymore. That was very popular in the mid 1800s. So we as a society were like, let's go, let's stop this. And I don't think there's anyone like, oh, why can't you blackface? We get blackface comedians back. It's just no one is saying that. So, um, so there's two things that are going on. The comedians have to perform in front of the crowds now, they have to make these people laugh. And obviously social norms change over time. I'll give you a perfect example. It's a little outside of stand up, but shows like Friends or Seinfeld, which were extremely popular sitcoms when they were on in the 90s. Now just Google problematic Seinfeld or problematic <laughs> <laughs> friends or something like that. And you'll see like, okay, now maybe these jokes about whatever uh yeah. overweight people or you know so so just society changes and yeah. i i just want to say that i feel like stand-up comedy i know you want to say it's it changes society i feel like stand-up comedy more reflects society mm -hmm. than changes it because we have to live with the audiences that are out there now so that's that was... my and i'll leave it i'll leave it with this that george carlin once said about being offended he said that it's the comedian's job to find out where the line is and that's where you someone would find something offensive and then deliberately go over the line that was the job of the comedian now that's not the job of every comedian some of us are very easy going we don't go anywhere near the line but <laughs> but anyway i just thought that was an interesting point of like that comedians need that latitude to be offensive as well so and that well that's it that's, well, that, that's a, that, you that was kind of exactly my next question oh. um are comedians well are comedians responding to society or are there examples of you know comedians because of their work literally changing people's minds or asking the questions i mean i'm sure that there are um mm -hmm. does, does anyone come to mind that you know that it's so strongly in that in that camp not of this decade. I mean, I'm thinking of Dick Gregory yeah, I mean, in terms, mom, yeah, man. yeah, because Dick Gregory uh, was, you know, he's the first uh, black male comedian to perform at the Playboy Club to a room of white Southerners, right? And a lot of his success had to do with like, his strategy around how do I bring these issues mm -hmm. that I want to talk about to this audience, with, even though the audience might not have uh, be receptive to it, right? And so how can I reflect society, things to society that society doesn't want to see? Yeah. Um, and he was able to translate uh, his work in stand-up into an actual career in, um, or just actual activism. You know, he went out and was actually marching and uh, translated uh, yeah. his sort of skills on stage to activism and really brought that, uh, changed people's mind in that capacity. I think now... One, one thing I kind of wanted to bring up was the podcast, like how many comedians uh -huh. have podcasts, because mm -hmm. I think that's a way that comedians nowadays are positioning themselves in almost every kind of social discourse outside of the stage, where there's less pressure to maybe get a laugh, but maybe more opportunity to just have this kind of freeform 
uh, discussion, right? So you have, there's, I mean, I think every comedian has a podcast nowadays. It's very rare to, to find a comedian that doesn't, but I mean, just off the top of my head, Joe Rogan, everyone, even if you don't listen to the podcast, you know, he has a podcast, right? Um, and so every kind of topic can kind of run through that. And I think that's a different way that comedians are trying to engage people, maybe in a kind of depressurized way outside of the performance space. Pressurized. I like the def- the uh, the description of that. Um, I mm-hmm. mean, I kind of wonder if part of it in terms of changing society or influencing society can be just the identity of the stand-up comic. I mean, is that mm-hmm. that's a little bit of the work that you do, Lanita, right? That you've written about. Um, you you talk about authenticity. And mm-hmm. I mean, I assume that that is a huge part of it is the identity, regardless of the words that they're saying that, you know, because we've talked about the power and the presence that you need as a stand-up comedian, is that part of it just by, um, you know, just, just the identity of the stand-up comic? Is that part of uh, what's coming to play here? Yeah. I mean, I can't help but presence um, Bill Cosby in this regard, um, because it brings to the four questions of not just authenticity. And again, rem- remember when I'm talking about authenticity, I'm talking about notions of real blackness and, and the like, which I think uh, Cosby nodded to all the time, um, but also got to the point where he was so universal that you just wanted to hear what he had to say because he's a tremendously gifted uh, comic and, and actor. But I think the question of sincerity comes to the fore because in some ways Bill Cosby uh, got canceled, um, not necessarily because of something he said on stage, mm-hmm. but because of uh, egregious instances that were happening um, affecting um, women um, for, for many generations. And um, I think the pain that uh, a lot of people are, are had to reconcile with was the um, translation between his uh, comedic persona um, and his television persona as this kind of noble father figure um, and um, someone who could uh, commit some of the, some of the, the, the rapes that he, he had done um, off screen. Um, so uh, yes, there are ways in which authenticity can be very significant, um, but then there are also ways in which what Cruz is talking about, what is that distinction between um, how you present um, on stage, what you say you're supposed to be, and how you are off stage? I think because of social media and the like, and because of cell phones, <laughs> people can always be searching for these discrepancies <laughs> between what people say and what people do, and they can forget something that Wayne knows full throttle, and that is that Comics in some ways are themselves when they're on stage, but they're also projecting um, what they need to project to get the laugh. I'm not even sure I answered your question, Kirsten. No, I, no thank you. I like to hear it. Okay. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, I, I, I want to just piggyback on that. I mean, there's no better example than Moms Mabley, who created an entire yeah. character on stage. So is that less authentic than what, say, uh, Amy Schumer's doing? I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is, all I know is they're both standing on stage trying to get laughs. And like I, I'm going to also second what Lenita said, that's the beauty of this art form, if you want to use the word art, on it. But I'm also thinking a little about, because there is a limit, and this piggybacks on what uh, Cruz was saying about podcasting. There is sort of a limit to what you can do with stand-up because there is the expectation of getting laughs and you just don't want to be lecturing a crowd the entire time. You want to be entertaining the crowd. That's that's what comedy is. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm thinking about what Hannah Gadsby did with her special mm-hmm. Nanette where yeah. she literally in the middle of a stand-up special, so she mm-hmm. has this the, you know, ev- this this forum that everyone agrees with the rules are. She was like, what I need to talk about for me and my lived experience, stand-up comedy does not cut it. I can't be trying to constantly getting, get laughs from you, the audience, and be feel like I'm really expressing what I need to experience. And she stops in the most special and, t- and talks about these experiences she had growing up. And so it's... It's powerful. Is it sta- is it stand up? I mean, it's a version of it. It's done mm-hmm. in the form of it. And then I just thought that was very interesting. And I really feel like there's a direct line between what she did and mm-hmm. what Dick Gregory did in the mm-hmm. 60s when he just stopped working in nightclubs for the most part mm-hmm. and just was like, oh, you need me in Selma. Do you need me in Birmingham? Do you need me down here? I'm going to do that. And those dates opened up for other comics. 
Yeah. So it was, I, I feel like even he, even though he brought levity to those situations was like, what I'm doing working the Playboy Club in Chicago is not really helping mm-hmm. what I want to do. That was my feeling. I don't know, Cruz, you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, about not. I mean, Nanette, I did. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, but I think about it all the time. And it was mm-hmm. years, years ago. I mean, I, I mean, it was really powerful because of. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, she has an incredible comic voice, and I guess like, and then breaking away from that, I thought was was really powerful. Cruz, mm-hmm. go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just on Nanette thinking about how one of the things she says, you know, this tension is yours. I'm not going to do anything, mm-hmm. do anything about this tension for you. Mm-hmm. And in when when theorists, when scholars are talking about stand up, that tension is really the thing that's getting diffused, right? Mm-hmm. Or the thing that people are trying to uh, bring up, bring to the table, and then play with, in a sense. And we see there are so many different examples of when that goes bad, you can actually, it lapses into violence. I think like comedy and and violence have a very interesting relationship to one another, particularly like it's coded into the language that we use to describe it. When you do well, you know, you knocked them dead, you killed that. Um, And and then if you did wrong, you bombed and you brought us all along with you. Right. So there's this way that like, uh, like that, that language of, of violence is kind of coded into um, stand up itself. And one other thing I was going to say in relation to the limits of comedy in relation to where it's performed, because uh, I see one of our questions is like, you know, outside the comedy clubs in the 90s, the, you know, alternative comedy scene brought comedy into uh, coffee shops and bookstores and stand up got a little bit more experimental where you could play with maybe more anecdotal uh, autobiographical things, or you could you know, try different characters. There was something about like the actual comedy clubs that produced a a type of comedy. And I think uh, comics responded to that and said, you know, I want to try something else. And part of that is what's changing the location. So I think stand-up, one -hmm. one of the things that I've learned about stand-up is it's so sensitive to where it's performed, to who it's performed. Um, You know, these are all, uh, you know, elements that comprise a performance in and of itself. And I think that's important to remember when we're trying to evaluate, you know, the rightness or wrongness of a particular joke or special or set. What would happen? I'm going to look in the chat. We have questions. Yes. Let's audience. do it. Live studio audience. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. So Benjamin, let's go with Benjamin. Benjamin says, can stand up comedy be harmful as well as liberating? This is kind of what you just touched on, Cruz. Um, mm. Can laughter or humor and the rhetorical power of the comedian be used to marginalize other people? Uh, if so, how can or should there be boundaries set over content or should comedy be anything goes regardless of who may be offended? All right. So at its heart, can can comedy be harmful? Are there examples of that? Yeah. Wayne? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I mean, of course, of course it can. And we've all seen, you know, very biting things uh, said about groups of people. And yeah, but the second part of it is is I don't think there should be boundaries set. And I know this is something we talk about in our program w- between uh, over at uh, mm-hmm. School of Dramatic Arts, which is something called punching down, which yeah. is where the comedian in a certain uh, power structure of, <laughs> of the United States is not allowed to make jokes about people who are maybe less powerful for them or seem less powerful for them. I don't agree with that but i know a lot of comedians are just like i don't want to do any comedy that's not i'm I'm only punching up at the most powerful presidents congressmen senators people who can actually do something as opposed to ah my gardener i don't want to be making fun of that and again that's a personal choice but uh but i'm a believer that you can make fun of comedians the the whole beauty of it all is that comedians one of the few people that can look at everything in life from the worst Think cancer, well, you know, Holocaust, anything, and anything is on the table if you're creative enough to get a laugh out of it and have a through your comic lens a perspective on it. So, I I don't think there's anyone who agrees that comedy can't be harmful to people. But the question is exactly what Cruz said: to who and under what context and what does and also like what is the comedian? 
What is his intent or her intent with this joke? Is it to harm or is it just to get a laugh? Mm -hmm. That's my feeling. Yeah. Do, you, do you agree, Cruz or Lenita? <laughs> Yeah, so I was, I mean, I was thinking immediately of, you know, what's an example of a uh, of harmful comedy, and you can go straight to, you know, the race, any racist caricature of mm -hmm. a type of person that reduces them to, uh, you know, comes some kind of absurd uh, caricature of themselves, it's right? Not uncommon until really very recently, honestly. Right, yeah. yeah, and that's why Moms Maybelline's too is so, like, important, because she was a character, but she understood that for Black Americans, and for black comedians, you a lot of those, a lot of characters were just racist caricatures, right? So she was building a character that really uh, voice, right? And was able to bring that to the forefront. Um, and I think I'm forgetting the second half of this question of the limits. <laughs> I'm thinking mm -hmm. of Dick Gregory. Mm -hmm. I learned so much from comedians. But Dick Gregory had said in an interview that part of your material is limited by your identity. Right. And the examples he used was if you're a rich person, it doesn't make any sense for you to make jokes about being poor. Or if you're a particularly really pretty person, you can't really go mm -hmm. on stage and say you're mm -hmm. ugly. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that was his strategy for trying to find ways to bring things uh, to, to find the line, but figure out where that line was in relation to him and his identity. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind where it's like, I think nowadays people get in trouble because there's like things that don't even relate to them. Like I'm thinking, you know, Andrew Dice Clay, Sam Kinison, the eighties, you know, making gay jokes, um, which wasn't really even part of their brand, which was more like rock and roll, like women, that kind of thing. And so uh, there's this like kind of confusing thing of like, why, well, what is your actual investment in these topics? And I think that's what audiences pick up on, where there's like, huh, are you actually telling us something that you believe about these communities? Or are you, you know, just looking for a laugh? That's something that can get distinguished. Can we talk, I mean, can we talk briefly about Dave Chappelle um, and, and recent remarks, um, mostly about the transgender communities? This comes up in my, my students bring this up a lot. Um, it's really important to a lot of people. Can, I mean, what, 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 what is the, what is the vibe on that, I guess? <laughs> or what, what should we, how should we re-respond? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I feel like Dave Chappelle is, I'm sorry to, uh, real quickly, I feel like Dave Chappelle is a perfect example of what's going on in stand-up. It's the mm -hmm. shining mm -hmm. example in that two competing values are clashing. Mm -hmm. One competing value is free speech. We want to hear what Dave has to say. It might offend us. It might <laughs> We may disagree. But we want mm -hmm. comedians to have the latitude when I buy a ticket to see Dave Chappelle. What's on your mind, Dave? Let's do this. Mm -hmm. The other competing value is oh, you don't want people who go to a show or watch a special to feel bad because they feel like they're being unfairly attacked or characterized in an unfair way. So these are two competing about, no one wants to hurt anyone's feelings, but we also want free speech. And so when these things collide, we get what's happened happening with Dave Chappelle. That's the way I look at it. Lenita, what do you think? Am I close? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, you are. Um, and closer than I'll ever touch because I never um, took a stage with a mic and was charged with <laughs> making someone laugh. I appreciate the difference mm. as a scholar of stand up comedy as opposed to stand up comics. Um, but Dave Chappelle, I just got through talking about um, Chimamanda Ngoza Adichie. And um, she is a famous Nigerian um, author. And she found herself embroiled in controversy when two students she mentored maybe one of whom may have been trans, maybe both, um, but accused her of being transphobic and actually it said people should come after her with machetes, where she was so hurt uh, by it um, that that hurt kind of morphed into anger and she ended up pinning a response to it. And she affirmed her, her comments and tried to add some more nuance. She said, look, what I said at the time is that there's a distinction between um, trans women and the category that people call cis women. And it might be important for us to appreciate those differences. Um, then she realized, ah, I'm living in a moment where people are dying because they're trans. People are looking at them and deciding, mm -hmm. I don't like the way you're trying to move around. Your gender is not mm -hmm. fluid. 
gender is fixed um, and I want to now hurt you and I want to. And so she came back and she said, what I should have said is that trans women are women insofar as gender fluidity and that's how they identify. Why? Because she was realizing that in this current milieu, in this current milieu where uh, transphobia it kills people, um, I need to put the emphasis here. And I think that Dave was trying to do something similar on a comedy stage. Um, and we could ask questions about the way that he did it. He has a trans friend and, or he has a gay friend and, and, and that friend loves him. So he's not transphobic. And, um, but I think he was trying to uh, usher in a conversation about those kinds of distinctions. And I think what Wayne just said is, is very important and also Cruz too, is that, oh gosh, I don't know how this is gonna come off, but, uh, Kevin Hart said something in one of his last two specials and he was like, the audience, you guys have ruined it for me. You guys have just made it harder to do what it, what it is that we do, you know? And just as we're asking these questions about comics, I wonder if those of us who are in the audience of comedy clubs um, might appreciate that some of the jokes that we may have laughed at 10 years ago, we're not laughing at the same way. Me, any joke that sneaks up on um, uh, anything that casts aspersions on me too, I, I just, it just doesn't land on my ear in the same way. Whereas in years past, I would have been chuckle, 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 you know? Mm. And so I think this question could uh, be expanded out to not only um, grapple with how have um, comics changed and, uh, but also how have audiences changed and how do we mature in certain kinds of ways where um, comedy has a, 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 a appeals to us or not. Let's ask that. And someone in the audience did also. It says, how is audience sensitivity changing? That's where the line is for stand-up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you 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 did, did you kind of answer that. People, I mean, comedy mm -hmm. is the arguably the fastest dying art form. Not that's, that's not correct. Uh it is how am I trying to say? Wayne, it's the most <laughs> short-lived, short-lived art form, right? It does not. Oh no, yeah, that's I agree with this. You're, Sorry, you, it does comedy, stand-up comedy is yeah. ethereal. It, ethereal. Does, it doesn't have right. a, it doesn't have a long shelf life. It's for the here and now. So exactly, even Lenita was like, "Oh, something I laughed at ten years ago. I'm not laughing at it." And a that's again weeks, back back to my life. back to my whole friends analogy and that. Audiences change, but they've always been changing. This is nothing new. Audiences have always been changing and evolving, and comedians either adapt or they fade away and are replaced by some other comedian that can make this audience laugh. So the line, I think, does change, whatever that is. But again, I think we should celebrate comedians or risk being offensive. Again, I'm the least offensive comedian. I do Taco Bell material. But my point is there's comedians that really push that thing and I I enjoy them even if it's even if it's against my sensibility as a human being I just I enjoy if it's a well structured joke so it's all about that and it's different for every comedian so I just want people to say this is my thing is a lot of people are like oh that's not funny I think people should just start saying that's not funny to me which is a little different than that's not funny because now you're saying, oh, I'm responsible for my worldview and the box I'm going to allow myself to laugh in. And if you think that's not funny, you're basically being saying that's not funny for everyone. And then you're a egomaniac because suddenly your idea of where the boundaries of comedy are should be for everyone. All right. I'm done yeah. talking about that. Cruz, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, well, I think it's interesting to distinguish between the live audience and the online audience, mm -hmm. yes. because I think with a live audience, there's a level of prep work and actually like, you know, being in line for the club and then you, <laughs> you sit, you get, you sit down, you get your drinks. There's a level of like preparation that you get like before, like the material comes at you. Whereas online, you know, these things can come like at any time during the day, you know, going back to Dave Chappelle, I haven't seen the special but I know the punchline or the the line, you know, I'm team turf. And mm -hmm. so without like even seeing the special without any, you know, I didn't buy a ticket to that show, but yet I'm still getting the jokes are leaking out. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important mm -hmm. that like, you know, when are comedians crossing the line and when has the line found me when I wasn't at the mm -hmm. show, nice. you know, like I, there's something like kind of strange there. And then another thing on the internet, which, you know, I'm trying to think through now is the internet troll. 
you know, the person who <laughs> the anonymous figure online who feigns outrage, because there is something very lucrative about outrage on the Internet. You know, mm -hmm. you can publish articles about it. You can, mm -hmm. you know, get get engagement and engagement is, you know, you know money and essentially. So where are we actually, you know, it's it's just interesting, you know, how are, how can we actually gauge, you know, where a special actually landed with people um, versus uh, reactions that might actually be part of this larger um, social media kind of machine? And do we have any, you know, tools to actually make those distinctions? It's hard. Yeah. Great point. Great point, Cruz. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, it's something I can, I think the working kind of academic theory of humor is the concept of benign violation. Um, and so uh, for something to be funny, it has to violate you and be gentle enough to not kill you. Um, and that's going to vary from person to person very much. And there's a lot of nuance to that. Um, all right. So forward facing, we're almost at the end of our hour here, but uh, let's see, we have one more question from John that I think can kind of point us toward the future in terms of stand-ups uh, influence on society. Um, at the grassroots in the clubs, okay, clubs, but we can expand it to online. Do you see fewer young people aspiring to do stand-up than 10 or 20 years ago, presumably due to cancel risk, or is the occupation of being a comedian as attractive as ever before? What's the state of comedy these days, everyone? Mm. <laughs> That's a tough one. Well, I, I mean, to me, that's an easy one. I feel like there's oh, more right. people who want to be comics now than yeah. ever before. And when I started, there were tons of people that wanted to be comics. It's a very lucrative at the high end of it. And it's an incredible life where you're bringing joy to people each night and you get to be a big shot and you work an hour a night. It's it's one of the greatest jobs ever cre <laughs> created. And most people's biggest fear is standing up on a stage talking to people, let alone mm -hmm. with the expectation of trying to get laughed. Just talking is mm -hmm. more than death for a lot of people. So it's a very difficult thing to do at a high level. And I think people are flooding into it still with something to say. And I feel like every generation has created great, incredible comics. So I'm not worried about it in the least. Mm -hmm. Especially, I imagine that even if you're not getting to the clubs, like people are doing versions of a stand-up routine on TikTok, you know? Um, it's mm -hmm. maybe not the same, but it's certainly adjacent. Um, mm -hmm. do, what yeah. state of comedy, Lenita? Um, they, or Cruz? Yeah, are the people? Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, I, since you brought up TikTok, I've been thinking about, you know, TikTok is kind of like a new digital vaudeville where there's just all these variety acts that you can kind of just... <laughs> endlessly scroll through but there's also you know uh character work coming back you know the uh terry joe's live feed is hilarious and it's people you know interacting with this person doing a, a doing a character and it's some of like the funniest snippets yet right but that's also something interesting about like it's comedy but it's also character and yet it's live and so i think yeah the people are finding ways to you know, engage each other via laughter, even if it's not necessarily just behind the mic. Um, it's, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let yeah. Me yeah I'm, I'm just saying I agree. Um, I feel very privileged to have been in the clubs uh, proper. Can I just say that? <laughs> the clubs proper <laughs> from 2001 to 2008. It's a, it's a whole different animal. Um, okay. But certainly during the pandemic, it was beautiful to see all the various forms of humor coming to us um, online. Way. Can I bring this full circle to your the first answer from Lenita, which was at Thanksgiving, listening to adults, listening to humor. So in a way, like the Internet, those people weren't in a club that were downstairs in that basement listening to that. So that was already once removed from the situation. And so all throughout the history of stand up, I always say that stand up comedians are like pornographers. They adapt to technology very quickly. So whether that was radio or uh, television or the records or now the internet or TikTok or podcasting or any of that stuff and you know, microphones, electric microphones, all of that stuff, comedians always tend to be fast and nimble adapters. Okay, last question really fast. Um, is there a current stand-up comedian working now, maybe an up-and-coming that you are especially drawn to that you enjoy that you'd recommend? Cruz. Uh, 
uh, uh, I'll say Bo Burnham. Oh, uh, Bo Burnham. Uh, okay. Bo Burnham, yeah. Okay. Yes. Lenita. Um, I'll say the gentleman who availed himself for, I don't know, no less than two years to meet with me weekly to talk about stand-up comedy, um, Maranzio Vance. Nice. Okay. Great. Wait. Great. Uh, there's a comedian named Sam Morrell who, who he's starting to pick up a little bit. And I just think he's a wonderful old school joke writer, really very, very thrilling to watch him. But that's it that for a young guy. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, thank you all so much. I learned a lot. Um, I've never done stuff in stand up comedy. I appreciate you all. Um, <laughs> I want to say to if there's any undergraduates watching, the USC School of Dramatic Arts has a comedy minor that I think literally every single USC student should take. You get to take class from Wayne and from me. And um, I have go watch some stand up comedy, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Bye.